and this is a tough pronunciation, but I'm going to attempt it. Stix Hexenhammer 666 on YouTube. He is, uh, by my estimation, one of the smartest commentators on YouTube on such a wide variety of uh, topics. He's otherwise known as Carl Warwick. Again, another easy pronunciation. But Carl, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you here. I'm a big fan of your videos. Now, I want to get into the uh, technical details of what's happening over at YouTube with their new censorship program, the whole limited state thing. But first, I want to get into uh, the overarching agenda. We had Julian Assange, no less, earlier today tweet this. I'm going to read it. This is where young men not on the left are now getting their social or political education. This includes people like at Prison Planet. He also mentioned you, of course. He's talking about people going to YouTube, uh, people getting their commentary, their inf information from video content, not necessarily from written content. He went on to say, while the US left still has its anti-war heavy hitters, the new vibrant English speaking organic culture is oral and emerges from self-made videos on YouTube and forums. That was Julian Assange in a tweet earlier today. You know, uh, Carl, I joked a few months ago that YouTube was becoming a right-wing safe space because the left just can't compete on there. You've made videos about that in the past. They get downvoted. Their videos either get no traction or they get completely trashed. Of course, you know, it's, it's far easier to spit out a virtue signaling tweet than to actually take the time to script, dictate, and edit a 10-minute YouTube video. So the question is, you know, how much of this censorship when it comes to YouTube is down to Google compensating for the left's laziness and their failure to resonate with an audience, particularly, you know, particularly a younger audience on YouTube? I think it's a lot of it is down to laziness because, because it's a lot easier to virtue signal on Twitter than to actually sit down and craft a YouTube video that's going to resonate with people. I think that a lot of it is uh, really on the fiscal side as far as Google itself is concerned. Uh, I, think, I think they're legitimately worried about advertisers going elsewhere, but the thing is, they're not going to be able to get any of those advertisers back just by pretending to be moral. Everyone knows that ultimately it's about the money. If they didn't have a problem with the ad companies, they probably wouldn't censor anything. They probably wouldn't care. They'd put anything on YouTube and allow it to be there so long as it was making them a paycheck. In, in so far as that's concerned, I don't think it's really pressure from the left so much as on a fiscal level. The pressure from the left uh, appears to be brought to bear. Uh, they're going after domain registrars now. It's not just you know, Google or any Google service. They've gone after Gab uh, most recently. They've gone after other sites as well, um, ad firms themselves. I think what happens is that some, some group of authoritarian leftists that don't want anyone to have a good time, they don't have good ideas, they're like, oh, well, we can't compete with anybody. We need to lean on the advertisers. So they use the advertisers, I think, as a form of middleman. And Google has to be aware of this going on. They have to know that it's going on. But they're kind of stymied in their ability to respond because they're like, well, we don't want to lose even more money, I suppose. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I just I just don't see that many successful left wing commentators on YouTube because they still have a huge traffic on the late night comedy shows. But in terms of <laughs> independent content creators, they're just they're pathetic. They get owned every single time. And I think that's part of it. Uh, even like Vice and New York Times came out a couple of months ago and said, basically said, yeah, I was right, that the, the, the right or libertarians or whoever are completely dominating YouTube. So I think it is a, a part of the motivation behind wanting to censor it. Just getting into the technical details, um, of course, we had this announcement from Google last week, I believe they would censor offensive or controversial content, which of course is totally subjective. They introduced this limited state. Just explain what limited state means and what kind of videos are being censored right now. Yeah, as far as I can tell from the list of limited state videos, 90% of them are things that technically do breach the TOS, so I'm not even sure why they're retaining it on the platform. But then you've got the problematic group, which is stuff that doesn't violate the TOS. Well, why is it in limited state? It should just be there. If, if they're worried about it, then there should be a public debate over the actual content. I don't even think, to, to your, to your uh, uh, mention of like, uh, like the left online, there are people on the actual left, as opposed to like, you know, Hillary Clinton, uh, neoliberal or something, that, that have made it, they're going to get censored too because they actually respond to some of the so-called offensive content too. 
they're just oblivious to this fact for the most part. Uh, but what it is, limited state is all about trying to hide things away, and it simply won't work. It's already not worked. Uh, some of these users posted stats on the videos that they had had moved to limited state. Some of it was Black Pigeon Speaks, not against TOS, not even really out there. I think one of the videos was kind of out there. The other two, not really. They were pretty mundane. Swan of uh, Tulena, I believe, and others. And when the content gets censored like that, somebody slaps it on a list somewhere. And other people think, wow, well, it must be cool because it's been put in limited state. The Streisand effect kicks in. All of a sudden, a hundred times more people are watching it. They just they simply can't interact with it on YouTube. And that's I think it's YouTube's plausible deniability at play there, where they, they don't really care per se if the material is there, but they're trying to appease those same leftists. And so they're like, oh, well, it's good. Yeah, it'll spread around far further. We don't really care, though, because all these NGOs that we're working with, they'll be appeased. People will just spread it around off of Google services. So it's all good, I guess. Yeah, it was interesting because I think one of those videos, and I didn't watch it all, but it was basically a woman in her living room from Finland or somewhere talking about the migrant yeah. crisis. That was one of them was, that was limited state. This is like, oh, this is the most shocking, controversial thing. Literally some woman sat in front of a webcam talking about things. But like you said, you know, um, it, it gives them that Streisand effect. It makes it illicit. It gives it this illicit cachet. I thought they would deal with that by just banning a whole range of things, but Right, as of this moment, it seems to be quite limited, the actual number of videos that they've censored in that way. So, you know, maybe it's so just a total up, measure. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to move on, though, because, you know, we're short on time. The whole moral panic over white supremacism, fascism. We had Calgary Police. I saw you talking about this the other day. They put out a list of uh, potential characteristics for parents whose children might be prone to joining racist hate groups. One of them was literally listening to heavy metal music. And you made the connection, uh, the comparison, how it's completely flipped. Like back in the day, it was the evangelicals, it was the Christian right that created this whole panic over, you know, satanic messages embedded in rock music. So it seems to have completely flipped where the so-called progressives are now the Puritans, right? Exactly. Uh, I, I expect them to start burning albums or something like that, or, or <laughs> literally burning books. Like, like, you know, 10 years ago, we're talking about good, pious, generally right-leaning, at least, Christian individuals are like, Harry Potter doesn't belong in the library, Harry Potter doesn't belong, you know, Lord of the Rings or something doesn't belong in the school, why is it there? It's offensive to us, so we must suppress it because it's offensive. It's the same thing that they're saying now, it's just different people saying it. But I think part of it is, uh, those, some millennials, not all, like I'm a millennial myself, but some, or I should say many, They've done what the, the people who stood against the reigning culture in maybe the 80s did, which is they got older, they got more boring, and now they're moralistic. But they've been imprinted on differently from past generations. Back then it was, you listen to Iron Maiden and Ozzy, you must be a Satanist. You must be worshipping the devil. We got to look out about you, probably put you through therapy. It certainly shouldn't let you speak freely because it's so offensive and it'll cause crime and all these things. Now they say the same thing. The Calgary police, as you pointed out, they come out and they say, loud, angry rock music makes you a Nazi. So if they're listening to literal anarcho-punk, something that communists would listen to, that also makes them a Nazi. And I, I think the average person, if they saw it phrased differently, if they're getting this report from the old guard legacy media, they might just gobble it down. But if they hear somebody online, and this is, I think, what they're worried about, satirizing the fact that it's so dumb, then they say, oh, yeah, of course it's dumb. That doesn't make any sense. You know, they were listening to, like, Iron Butterfly or, or something like that. And it all comes back to, again, identity politics, this moral hysteria. Salon.com had a headline a couple of days ago, time to give up on identity politics. It's dragging the progressive agenda down. MSNBC this morning was talking about how the uh, identity politics thing just doesn't work electorally for Democrats. Why are they still doubling down on it? But of course, the top comment, call on this uh, Salon.com article was somebody whinging about how the writer of this article saying identity politics no longer works for the left is just expressing their white privilege. So I don't, I mean, I see a few chinks of light where they're like, actually, no, what are we doing here? This is not working. But I don't see the left giving up on identity politics yet. It's, it's such an enraged, enthused cult right now that, you know, we had 
the uh, the mainstream media, some top celebrities come out and even endorse and uh, endorse Antifa after the whole Charlottesville thing. So they only seem to be doubling down on it. My point that I've made is, uh, and this was a point made by the University of Tennessee professor Glenn Holland Reynolds. He said that this rampant craziness, this hysteria that's being ginned up by the establishment media, which results in, you know, Antifa assaults, results in riots, such as the riots after Trump was elected, that is going to cause ordinary voters, ordinary Americans to clamor for right wing authoritarianism. So the actual panic that they're engaged in about, oh, my God, literally a fascist has taken over the White House, which is, of course, complete bunkum. They could actually ironically bring that real scenario about right-wing authoritarianism by their very actions. Do you see something like that playing out, or do you think it's kind of going to simmer down as we get further away from uh, the, whole, the whole riot and the Charlottesville thing? Well, I hope that it simmers down, but that wouldn't be historically the case. Usually what happens, we see this in the wake of the Red Scare, the, the satanic panic. Every time before, the only reason it simmers down is because uh, the whatever group was empowered to be abusive falls by the wayside. They become outdated. Youth rebellion usually boils over, destroys them. And then that subs after 10, 15 relatively calm years, the next generation as it grows older does the same thing. It seems to be an innate human characteristic. My hope is that at the very least we can safeguard. This is the big thing about alt tech. If we just safeguard the Internet as a place to express yourself so people aren't being harassed, abused, attacked, deplatformed, whatever, for, for voicing simple opinions, then it doesn't matter if we're in a moral panic. At the very least, people will always be able to speak freely, and as, if they can speak freely, good ideas, non-abusive ideas, hopefully, tend to win out over time. If we allow overt censorship of the main mode of human communication, which is the Internet now, if we allow it to become too heavily censored and all tech is suppressed, then we, we probably fall into another dark age. It would, it would hold back all of human development on just an economic level, not even just a cultural level. It'd be terrible, I think, for this entire world. And of course, the, the argument that I've heard many times, and I've made the argument, you know, why don't you just build your own video platform? Why don't you just build your own social media platform? The argument before was, it's pointless, it will just be an echo chamber, you won't be reaching the masses, you'll be preaching to the choir. That seems to have shifted a little bit, especially, you know, BitChute came out with a, I think it was a tweet where they showed their traffic going through the roof after I just gave them a few tweets, you did as well, a couple of other prominent people. You said, I saw a video where you were saying Gab wasn't an echo chamber, that's the main criticism that they get. Mm -hmm. Question is, is it worth it? Should we just stick to the big dominant forums or should we actually start moving our content over, at least giving, you know, BitChute the exclusive first upload on the video, things like that. Do you think that is worth it? Or is that just a, a backup measure and we should continue with these main big platforms like YouTube as our primary uh, content generators? I think the best strategy is we stand and fight on the big sites as much as possible. Hopefully things get better. Hopefully the, the long-term human trend is bucked. No more problem. Alt media is still there. That will have its own audience. But like I've been putting my content on Vidme. I do exclusives there. I put it on BitChute. I'm on Minds. I'm on Gab. I'm on Twitter. I'm on everywhere, basically. I've got two blogs for just my books because I could no longer just rely on Blogspot because I said, well, some people are being, if you look at Jordan Peterson, he gets kicked off even Gmail for something posted on YouTube. So how am I supposed to trust Blogspot? It has nothing to do with my political discourse. It's just where I sell books. But we should, we should definitely try to maintain sites that have already been built. I'm not saying we should flee anything, because uh, that's just the worst possible decision to make, because then that uh, turns into an echo chamber, too. It'd be used for attacks on alt media. It would be freakish. But these new sites that are cropping up, they are growing. They're already not echo chambers. They're already entertaining, so why not use them? As far as a site like Facebook, it's already not entertaining. Facebook is worthless now. YouTube's entertaining. Twitter can be entertaining. Facebook's the odd man out. Who, I, why even bother using it? I wouldn't even use it at all if there weren't a couple of people I know in real life that I even talk to there. Now, I just want to get your take quickly on this new announcement today. Verit. This is the big Hillary Clinton-backed new platform. 
Media for the 65.8 million. I tweeted, media for everyone who has the same opinion about everything. I went on this site. It, it's confusing and bizarre. It, it seems like it, it's not you know, aesthetically pleasing. What is the point of this? It's very strange. It's Greek to me. I guess it's to take vetted information, put it in vaguely meme-like form and spit it out. Uh, but I was on there. They, ha they already had one bad-mouthing Bernie Sanders, and they choose just the wrong day to do this. This is why I think their site's doomed. On the same exact day, we get that quip from Hillary Clinton's own book. Oh, yeah, Ber basically Bernie Sanders cost me the election. He hobbled me permanently. He's such a terrible person. I'm proud to be a Democrat. I wish that Bernie was, is the exact line from there. How moronic can her strategy possibly be to think that that's a good idea? She's trying to ingratiate herself to, to the same, you know, neoliberals, the pro-war, you know, not really fiscally far left types that are just social authoritarians. They're trying to maintain power and all they can do, they, they don't even want to attack Trump half the time. They'd rather attack Bernie Sanders as long as Hillary Clinton wants to do it. So I think she's probably going to take advantage of this site. A lot of people will be alienated and it'll just it'll end up uh, not even just a left wing echo chamber, but specifically a pro Clinton echo chamber. And people will they'll slowly gravitate out as they realize Clinton's not going to run again. I don't think she will. All right. We're going to come back in the final segment with Carl Warwick to talk about his YouTube channel. Oh, we're skipping the break. OK, that's great. Carl, just with the final uh, outro here, I wanted to ask you about your kind of approach to this because you seem to make so many videos about so many different topics. You seem to have <laughs> such an extensive knowledge about everything. It's damn annoying, actually. But I just wanted to get a sense of, you know, how do you approach different topics? Do you do a massive amount of reading? I mean, what, what are your sources for information, essentially? Essentially, what I try to do, I try to keep up to date on everything that's happening in the world to the best of my ability. Uh, and there are, there are some fairly good sites. It's, it's sort of hit or miss because you can't rely upon the, the old guard. You can't go to CNN or Fox or anything like that. I don't watch TV. You can use their websites as a springboard, I guess, but why would you even want to give them views? Like, I'll archive it if I share their links out. I prefer using 4chan, uh, honestly, above anything else as a news aggregator at this point because it's simply, it, again, it's not the echo chamber some people believe that it is. And so you're getting all sorts of stuff. You can get local news an hour before it's broken by the lamestream sort of press. So I try to keep up to date on all of that. I, I like to read a lot when I can, when I have time. Um, and I just have a lot of interests, basically. Uh, that's basically what it's about. And I'm, I'm pledged to trying, uh, insofar as I'm able to, to break the stranglehold of the legacy media because they've they've lied to me since I was a little kid. They lied to me with Iraq. They lied to me with Afghanistan. They, they personally lied to me about basically everything I used to think was reality. And that honestly makes me mad. I don't think that I'm alone in that. No, I mean, there's huge resentment now against the likes of CNN. <laughs> Their reporters express bewilderment whenever there's a negative chant about them, whenever they go out in public. But Twitter, it seems, you don't get involved in the Twitter spats, which is something that I do. It's a massive vacuum that sucks up all your time, obviously. But from what I've seen, you don't tend to get too deeply involved in the back and forth on Twitter, I guess, because you know it's, it's kind of a small platform, really, in the aggregate, isn't it? Yeah, well, uh, Twitter was something that I never even planned on joining. I had originally said, I'll never have a Twitter. I'll never use any of these other sites. I was just a YouTuber. And then the far left decided, hey, we want more censorship. We want to marginalize people, manipulate all the algorithms. So I'm like, well, nobody's getting notifications. I need a Twitter account. But I'm, I try to avoid direct sort of confrontational stuff. I'd rather just make my own views known, put them out there. If somebody disagrees, that's OK. If they want to attack me, that's OK, too. I support their free speech, too. I don't care if they're a self-proclaimed communist. They can come aboard that they're never going to get banned on my channel just for insulting me. They would have to go after one of my other subscribers or post something that's blatantly illegal in order to get banned from the channel. All right, Carl, just in the final minute here, uh, tell people how they can find you on Twitter and YouTube. I guess if you just type in sticks, it, it kind of pops up automatically, right, on YouTube at least. 
Yeah, so you can search for that or Stix Hex and Hammer 666 on YouTube or Stix 666 official on Twitter or on uh, Gab, actually. Definitely go check out Carl's videos. Really insightful stuff. Carl, we'll have you back on the show soon. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you. There goes uh, Carl Warwick. Stix Hex and Hammer 666. That's S T Y X. If you search for that on YouTube, it will pop up. Again, amazing insight, amazing commentary on a whole manner of different subjects. Please click the big red button to subscribe. It really helps me when you do that. And click the bell to allow notifications so you never miss a new video.